Yeah, and uh, uh, grew up uh, seeing a lot of blockades and uh, fundraising drives and a lot of um, community nation effort to um, drive the Delgamut court case forward. This came from a community with no IBAs, uh, no capacity agreements, and very little employment. At the time, uh, First Nations people were largely left out of the resource industry and, uh, and, and their rights were under attack. But uh, so when I think back on that and I think about some of the nations that have had some of the most success recently, they're the nations that aren't afraid to drop the gloves and maybe sell them at an auction <laughs> so that they can get to a first meeting to make some of this happen. When we worked on uh, the ratification of the Statlium Hydro Agreement, I talked to the chiefs who started those negotiations. And uh, one of them told me he sold his leather jacket so he could get down to Vancouver to meet with the province. And another one told me he sold his horse so he could, so he could buy some gas. So the point is, in business, you know, we call it a lost leader. You know, you know you're going to lose money to get your foot in the door, to get ahead, but that there's going to be hopefully some great benefits down the road. And I think First Nations, and no matter how small you are, if you've got that spirit, if you've got the vision, you've got the fight in your belly, uh, you're going to get to a good agreement. But you have to realize that sometimes it means, uh, it means selling the leather jacket to, to, get, to get started. Um, professionally, what I've seen over the last 12 years, I started Copper Moon Communications with this vision um, that as an off reserve member, uh, we should be able to communicate with all the latest tools that we have. We know and we've seen, and, and, and those of us uh, who've had the privilege of learning from some of our elders, we know that um, the way our societies were structured and worked, they were based around families, they were based around, in some cases, clans, uh, where we lived together, we made decisions together, and if something was going to impact our way of life, our culture, our community, we would make that decision carefully and collectively. We would bring everyone along in the making of that decision. You would not have, in the old days, chiefs negotiating behind closed doors and then coming out a few years later saying, ta-da, <laughs> I hope you all love me for it, but, but this is the deal. Um, so, what has shifted since then? Well, one of the really big things that shifted is in British Columbia, it's not unusual to see 70% of our members living away from the longhouse, away from the teepees, away from home, such as myself. So when I started the business 12 years ago, I thought, wow, look at all this new technology. You know, even at the time 12 years ago, you could, you could live stream video over the internet, except there was a small problem. Most people didn't know how to do it. Most people think I was speaking Greek if I said live streaming, and uh, so it was a little bit ahead of, ahead of the times. But over the past few years, what we've been doing is we've been figuring out if you're going, if the same principles still apply. If you are a leader, uh, and, I, and I mean a leader of any kind, I'm not just talking about a chief or a counselor, but if you're a leader and you've got the responsibility of making big decisions that are going to impact the family, the community, and the nation, then everybody needs to be brought along in that decision. And so that's what I'm, I'm here to talk to you about really quickly today because negotiating an IBA or, uh, or going through the EA process or, or any of the, those lines up on the screen, a lot of the focus tends to be on what's going to happen afterward. What are we fighting for? What, are the, what, are, what benefits are going to kick in after we sign and we ratify this agreement? What I'm here to talk to you about is what happens before you ratify and you sign that agreement. I'm here to talk about how is it that you get your mandates and you get an informed decision so that the whole family, the community, and the nation, no matter where they live, understand and support that decision. Because that's really, really important. Um, and I've talked about this, and I've even talked to industry, I've talked to government, and I've said, folks, we really got to start communicating a heck of a lot sooner, not when you're about to sign the paper, but well before. And they'll say something like this, well, it's too expensive. You know, we can't afford it. I talked to the province, they said, sorry, we're in austerity, you know. And I said, I said well, that's fine, but we, this First Nation just contacted me, and they're trying to ratify a modern treaty. They're working to ratify a modern treaty that represents, my understanding is, a $20 million investment on the province's side. And they have been given a $15,000 budget to communicate it. So, for those of you who put your business hats on for a second, how many of us 
would gamble a $20 million investment on a $15,000 budget. And what have we seen over the last couple of years? Well, about half of First Nations vote down the agreements and principles of modern treaties, and the other half, you know, it gets, it gets through. That's not a really great success rate if you're an investor, if you're, if you're someone trying to make wise business uh, decisions. And I'm not saying, I'm not pro or anti-treaty, I'm just, I'm just anti-terrible uh, communication and anti-terrible decision making, which is what I see a lot of happening in British Columbia, especially with First Nations. The protests in New Brunswick that ended up with the blockade, I mean, that cost the company $60,000 a day throughout that whole conflict, just in lost wages and, and impact to equipment. When you add in the cost to society uh, of that conflict, it, it gets much larger than that. Um, when we move forward with, with projects like LNG, when we learn, move forward with any kind of significant decision, uh, sometimes it's a banned election, <laughs> it can be a pretty significant decision that can lead to conflict if the communication is poor around it. Um, any significant decision, the communications has to be there, members have to be brought along. So, um, again, communication should be at the beginning, the middle, the end, and after any decision. It's really, really important. With effective community engagement and decision making, projects can move along very quickly. The difference is, is when communication is not there, conflict exists. Conflict will always exist in the absence of communication, no matter what. So, let's go back to the marriage example. Is this a great one? I, I think we should just like, you know, make that part of the script. Uh, I like to say, you know, if I go out and I sell my house, our house, that I own with my wife and my kids, and I come home and I say, ta-da, I sold the house, and I haven't told my wife anything about it, she's going to be mad. Even if it was a great decision and I thought through it and I hired a great lawyer, Merle's on my team, for example, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, we've, we, and we've done a great deal. So I've sold the house and, and I say, hey, hey, look, honey, I bought this, this collector's Ferrari, you know, and it's gonna, it's gonna appreciate in value. What a great decision. She's not gonna be happy with me because I didn't involve her, I didn't include her. It doesn't matter how good the decision is. And this is what I try and get through uh, to First Nations leaders, is it doesn't matter how great your decision making is as a professional, as an individual, or as a small team, if you're not bringing the whole base with you, the whole family, then conflict will exist. And with conflict, guess what? It's expensive. It costs a lot of money to fight. It costs a lot less money to communicate well, bring everybody along, and, and to move forward together. So the value, um, again, in the negotiation process often is looking after the deal. The value in communications is the process of reaching that deal. So it's creating real legacies in the community. So one example, when we work with First Nations, we make sure we can call every member, no matter where they are, and make sure they have an opportunity to participate, whether it's through a phone conversation, an email conversation, uh, a, a conversation around the, the, the coffee table, you know, over, over tea time. Uh, every member needs to have the opportunity to be involved in significant decisions that are going to impact the collective uh, title and the rights that flow from the title on the land. Um, so informed consent, and this is something a lot of people talk about, we need free prior informed consent. You hear that word, not a lot of people tell you how you achieve that. Because of course, it sounds great, but how do you do it, right? How do you do it? It's a, it's a pretty daunting thing. Because in the mainstream society, we get our mandates by be, getting elected. You know, you, you vote for me, I do whatever the heck I want for four years, and then I'm accountable after four years. And of course, in First Nations, we know that's not the case. We know that if, uh, and we've seen it time and time again, sometimes uh, if, uh, if, if, if a leader or a group of leaders make a pretty poor decision, uh, you know, members can uh, take action and uh, overturn that decision, sometimes direct action. So informed consent, the real question here is do people understand? And this is where, you know, sometimes lawyers and myself are a little bit of oil and water because uh, what we focus on is the comprehension and the understanding of what's happening, not the wording. 
So I remember being in a community meeting and uh, a presentation on a, a negotiation from a lawyer, and I was watching everyone's eyes glaze over, and, 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 uh, and, and as people were, as I was talking to people, I started just quizzing them. I said, uh, do you understand what, what a right-of-way is? No? Okay. Do you understand uh, what, uh, I don't know, I can't even remember those legal words that just kind of fall out the other ear. But I ended up doing a, a, a list, and it was very long, of all the words that people didn't understand that we just assume, you know, <laughs> that they would. So the point, the, the point is, is when you're up front uh, and you're talking, if nobody understands you, it's not informed consent. It never will be. So, so these are really important issues that uh, I encourage you to think about as you work on uh, fantastic IBAs and, and really great uh, environmental processes and joint ventures with companies. Are people informed? Are you bringing the family along with you? And when you reach the end, are people excited? Are they happy? And is there an absence of conflict? Because there should be if you're doing things right on the communication side. So thank you very much um, and uh, look forward to continued discussion. Thanks very much, Jacob. Merle, I'm not sure if you want to respond to any of that, but uh, OK, all right. Uh, I didn't understand what he was talking about. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> it, was so too, it was too plain speaking. No, I mean, I think it, it probably part of the, the, the problem, I think, is that uh, I think Jacob's got to make it, the group he's probably mostly got to agree, get to agree with him is the proponents themselves because I don't think that there's ever enough money ever set aside for proper communication. Um, and I've seen lots of, lots of negotiation budgets uh, set out for very comprehensive IBA negotiations and the, the First Nations uh, uh, community consultation component um, usually involves the negotiation team coming to a couple community meetings but it's not it doesn't involve bringing in a, de like a, 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 a professional communications team to actually communicate the, the process. Only maybe in very substantial uh, ratifications of large project agreements could you ever expect to see something like a really substantial communications uh, uh, process. So I mean, in truth, I mean, I think proponents themselves have to buy into the fact that if they want the community support to be truly behind the agreement, it's not just asking for ratification. Is that it's ensuring that there's money, appropriate money aside, and they know that on this on some level because they 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 hire very expensive community liaisons to 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 gallivant from community to community, and they spend a lot of money on on their community liaisons. They have a rough idea of what the cost of it would be to communicate. So, looking at the community liaisons right now, but I mean, I mean the main, I mean I think that. The companies understand that they need to spend a lot of money on media and communications. It's just a matter of, I guess, getting them to agree that to spend that money on, it's, imp it's important for them to not to spend it on themselves, but to allow the First Nation to communicate the deal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, if, you, if, if, the, if that was much more of an acceptable spend, I think you'd see it much more included in negotiation budgets. But because there's so minimal amount of money, the time gets, the, the budgets get focused purely on the actual deal, not on not on an actual proper communication protocol. Yeah. Clarence, do you want to add one, one component to that? Sure. I just want to say that we, in our community, we have a fairly onerous ratification process. We have to have uh, family meetings with all of the councillors, uh, with their families that they represent. So we have a mass mailing process that we, there's always a legal review done of the of the agreement and that's sent out in our mass mail and then we follow that up and we include it in the, in the very first agreement, the letter of agreement or the protocol agreement, there's a section that we have uh, for facilitating those community meetings of so, you know, four or $5,000 just so we can uh, go to the different areas where our community members are. We have lots of people in Prince George or Calgary or Vancouver so that we can do the work. Okay, and then, oh, Chief Derek, yeah. Yeah, for us, communications uh, has been always been a challenge, and like uh, Jacob said, uh, probably uh, two-thirds of our membership is off reserve, and in prior years, they always wondered what went on, but what we've done is we've held uh, uh, quarterly meetings for since 2008, and uh, continued to do that to provide opportunities since then, We've uh, developed Facebook pages and uh, uh, to try and get the correct information out there. 
because in I'm sure in any other First Nations, there's uh, fractions in the community and they don't always see eye to eye. So no matter what you do, uh, there's always gonna be conflict. For instance, at Mount Milligan, uh, we did a, the consultation went around and got the majority support of the people and we signed the agreement. Uh, after I was elected again, they uh, blockaded me and we were uh, blockaded out of the band office for 14 days and um, definitely a challenging time, but that was uh, two points of views and we're working to get that better and continuously looking to get a communication strategy. One of the other things that we're really working hard to do is get our members employed in the businesses that we own because then th they'll know what's going on, they'll hear the buzz and getting people back to our community. Uh, we spend a significant amount of money for our annual gathering assembly that we hold uh, each year in August. And we've got over 200 of our members back as well as about 100 business uh, people <coughs> to celebrate. And what we do there is we report uh, our financial statements for the prior year and uh, let anybody ask any questions to try and be as transparent as possible. So there are a lot of things that we're doing. In addition to that, we get proponents themselves to come out and do uh, uh, explain the projects. And